Hey, bonjour YouTube. Today I am with David and we're going to talk about how to stay productive when working remote. So if you're a remote employee in your job, then you definitely need to watch this video and hear what David has to say. Once again, we are DVD live, so we're recording uh, these videos in batch. As you know, it's always more productive. So Business by Design by James Wedmore, we had BBD Live event and it's freaking awesome. It is awesome. Yeah, you yeah. like it? Yeah, it's great. As usual, if you're interested in content on time management and uh, productivity, if it's your first time here, you definitely need to subscribe to this channel for more content like this. Hey, bonjour, I'm Hugo and I help busy professionals be more productive and get back in control of their own time. Hi, I'm David and I help individuals and businesses with natural and artificial language technology. So today with David, we're going to talk about being a remote employee and the difficulties that remote employee can have. And with the, the discussions that we had while at BBD Live uh, was about the lack of structure. So when you're a remote employee, you don't have a boss tapping on your shoulder that tells you you need to come here at eight uh, and etc. And just making sure that you work. So the lack of structure can be a difficulty, I understand. So when talking with David, he came up with uh, three types of boundaries that could help you structure your work when being a remote employee. I don't want to say too much. I want to I want to have David talk about it. So what is the first type of boundary that you come up with? Yeah, the, the first thing that, that comes to mind is um, the physical boundary that you might need or could have. Uh, and really all these are suggestions. They're what work for me and it makes a difference. There were challenges that, that come up like we talked about when you're working remotely. And the, the boundary or physical boundary is really important to have. Creating a dedicated space whether it's in your home or like having a dedicated space to go to if you're going to uh, uh, a shared desk at a collective workspace or if you're going somewhere else to not be in just sitting on your sofa right or sitting at your kitchen table so creating that physical separation is really important okay so when you're at home you have a like home office yeah is it one one uh, area uh, yeah. that is shared no it's no it's just your home office. it's exactly so um, it's an apartment and it's really small but what I did was go to uh, Ikea to get one of the screens that you can put up and that creates enough of a boundary and the only thing that I do back there is work. So I have my computer that's on a standing desk um, and it's separated from the living room by this screen. So I can like close the screen okay. and it's done, right? So that is my space behind the screen and I'll open it up um, and, and then I can work. Okay. so. In your working and uh, working space, you don't do anything else than work. No. And when you're in the living room, in the other living spaces, you don't work. Correct? Right. So that physical boundary can really help you structure and make sure that you uh, this stays hermetic, right? You don't want like to stop opening the door to uh, to right. anything, right? So the, the second boundary is an emotional boundary, and I think it sort of dovetails from the physical boundary where if you're working from home, for example, which is where I happen to work most of the time, it makes a big difference if you have separation emotionally from uh, work and the people that may cohabitate with you. Uh, if your partner comes home and you're even in your space, like there might be a greeting, but that's it. Yeah. Right? Like we don't interact um, if I'm working because it's like I'm in my office. I have, I'm at work basically, um, physically. And if we start interacting or something, or if you know, I've, I'm frustrated with whatever's going on, uh, if there's something at work that's like I'm dealing with, and then uh, I take that outside of my physical space and start interacting with kids, pets, partners, you know, whoever, um, that ends up getting kind of weird. And that's interesting that you talked about the emotional boundaries with a link with the physical boundary. Yeah. Uh, you say, I don't want to take the, my emotions, my work emotion outside of my space, if I, if mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. correctly. So maybe having that physical boundary can help you with the emotional boundary. Absolutely. That's how I see it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, that's something that I've, I've been struggling with to, to to be very honest, when I'm working on my passion project, Time Flies, it's kind of hard to set 
this boundary and say, okay, I should stop thinking about work and don't talk too much about work with my partner. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherry has her own business, my partner, and uh, I have my own business. And we talk a lot about work. Uh, and I don't know how people that are working as couples can actually have this emotional boundary. That, that must be so difficult. That takes work. Uh, yeah. No matter what, that takes work. It's not something, you know, having the screen is not going to prevent you from doing that. I mean, as it is, people come home from the office and they carry emotional baggage with them. So that's that's something else that I can help people with, but that's a totally different subject. I think for work, for home workers uh, especially, it's having that boundary, like you said, it's, it's a what I would refer to it as is a physical anchor. So it's an anchor where I can be in the state and the mindset of work when I'm over here, and then I do the best that I can. Obviously stuff carries over from one place to the next. It's almost inevitable, but it's a reminder whenever I come out from behind that screen that, oh yeah, I leave the emails and the everything else that I was dealing with at work behind that screen. Yeah. So, and that makes actually a good transition to the third boundary. Yeah, so the third boundary is time. Um, having a temporal boundary is really important where this, you know, if we both are living at the same place uh, and my partner gets home and I'm at home, then I, to the extent that it's possible, try to limit my day to, or have my day coincide with those things. I happen to work with people in, on um, almost all continents uh, except for Antarctica, not yet. <laughs> and um, so it, that's a challenge sometimes. But to the extent that it's possible, it's really important for me to say, okay, on my calendar, this is when I'm working, and to communicate that with my coworkers, to be sure that you know they know when I'm going to be available or not available. Also related to time, I will say that one of the biggest things for being productive as a remote worker is to not get on email before doing something that I actually need to get done. Because no matter what, in part because I work with people in Australia and Europe and India and um, various other places. I'm working from Seattle. So. I'm working from Seattle. So it's uh, covering all the time zones. Um, there could be emails that come in overnight. And even if you work with people that are in the same city, there are emails that come in overnight. And um, you don't need to see those as a distraction. It's kind of like, you know, looking at Facebook first thing in the morning or Instagram the first thing in the morning is not a really good way because you'll get sucked into the flow of Facebook or Instagram or email from whoever in your organization. And that's really important, uh, the email management system. So you, you know we're talking about how to manage your emails and you can refer to this video. You don't need to check your emails like all the time throughout the day, especially if you Absolutely. work with different like with people in different time zones, check your emails twice, maybe three times, but a limited amount of times daily to make sure that you are you staying productive and you're not like um, getting unfocused with all these notifications. Yeah, and if I can um, actually sort of flow from that, one of the things I use Outlook, um, but if you use Gmail and Google Calendar or whatever it is. Um, Obviously, Outlook has uh, the inbox and there's also the calendar view. So I'm always on the calendar view because all that it matters really is where is my day going now. So I'll uh, have blocks of time. That's the, and I will physically block out time so that no one can schedule meetings with me, which is really important. So that, you know, the first thing in the morning, I'm not available for interaction with, with coworkers because I want to get stuff done and then I'll check email. And then if there's anything that's urgent, which sometimes I say it's urgent because you know it's not really urgent, but people imagine it is. So those kinds of things I'll address then in the second block of the day. And then there, uh, this is the way that, that my company works. Uh, our meetings tend to be in the afternoon mm -hmm. because a lot of my meetings from the West Coast are with people in Australia, so it's the beginning of their day the next day. That happens to work out, but really just dedicating blocks of time on your calendar for the types of work and when is your creative work. Um, this morning I was thinking about this, I got up at 5.30 and I went on a long run and, um, and I was realizing how much my mind was getting great ideas and the types of things that I was thinking about were so much more rich or so much richer um, and I'd say fruitful. Yeah. Um, 
at that time of day. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't want to waste that on like back and forth with email. It doesn't make sense to me. So, yeah. so uh, studies show that uh, there are a lot of people are the most productive and most creative in the beginning of the day because that's where you have most of your energy. And as you know, energy is a scarce and uh, is, is dropping throughout the day. Uh, so yes, if you know your pattern, it doesn't have to be this way for you, but if you know your pattern and you know you're the most creative, uh, first thing in the morning, don't waste it on emails or on anything that is not related to what is important to you. You talked about urgent things, urgent versus important. You can check out this matrix, urgent, important. Um, and uh, so th that's very, I think, important <laughs> to stay aligned to your goals and to know your patterns, patterns to, um, uh, to actually be more productive. Yeah. So now it's time for the tete a tete. Yeah, actually he speaks French. <laughs> oh, was that not supposed to be in French? Okay. <laughs> so tete a tete, you know what it is. You know the rules. You guys know it's just, it, it happens that I don't have the beret because we're at DBD Live and I completely forgot about it. So first question, dogs or cats? Both with a slight preference for dogs. Okay. Mon more money or more sleep? Right now, more sleep. <laughs> Sweet or salty? Salty. Mornings or nights? All my friends would say I'm a night owl, uh, which is true, but I prefer to get things done in the morning. Yeah, this morning you told me eh, at 6 a.m. Eh, I'm going for a seven miles run. Yeah, you, you definitely a morning type of person. <laughs> Favorite YouTube channel? Bon Appetit. Oh, is that cooking? Bon Appetit magazine, their test kitchen has awesome videos. Okay, I'll definitely check that. How many cups of coffee a day? Two or three. Favorite cheese? Aged Manchego. Okay, white wine or red wine? Depends on my mood, but let's go with red. Most famous, uh, most famous French person that comes to mind? Edith Piaf. Edith Piaf. Uh, how many hours of sleep do you get each night? Mm -hmm. um, five, and friends will know that I'm lying, but let's say five. Five? How can you sustain a rhythm like that? <laughs> I, I, some days I'll do eight, but rarely. That's one. That one gonna be is gonna be easy. Say something in French. Uh, salut tout le monde en Louisiane. Je vais saluer à, à mes collègues, mes amis, uh, la famille en Louisiane. Voilà. That guy speaks French. Did you um, did you actually live in France? Uh, je travaille. I worked for the French consulate in the world. <laughs> okay, let's finish uh, the conversation sorry, in yes, French. In English. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, stereotype about French people. Haha, <laughs> so I love to say this. I hate it, but I love it. Um, that French people think that they're better than everyone else. Yeah. Why do you think that? I mean, I've <laughs> met him, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not... That, that's kind of true. Especially in Paris. Sorry for the Parisian people. Uh, what's the book currently on your nightstand? Everything is figure outable. Uh, it's Marie Forleo's new book. Oh yeah, I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, Marie Forleo is. Yeah, such it just a... came out. I think last month, maybe. Yeah. Ago, yeah. Like What's your mantra or phrase you live by? Uh, I would have to say, eat, drink, and be merry. Ah, that's <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> What's your kryptonite? Um, this is going to sound terrible, but it may be um, saying too much after I've been drinking. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So. It was just suggesting that we have a drink after. Yeah, we. I, I want to see that. <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, using apostrophes as accent marks in English <laughs> drives me crazy. Um, and when a, a cafe or something has the wrong accent mark yeah. on an E, drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's completely random. <laughs> But <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, I hope you found value in what David shared uh, with us on his experience as being a remote employee. Uh, do you did you guys like this content? If you did, just press the like button that is right here.